Hi, I'm Luke Drzezinski. I'm Jake Sullivan. And I'm Gabe Brunswick. Catch us on GPS 19. Champlain, and today I am traveling with Mr. Goodwin's Latin Club to study the superb collection at the Slater Museum. Joining me to discuss the Slater Museum is Vivian Zoe. Good morning, Miss Zoe. Good morning, Rita. <laughs> Thank you for talking to us. It's my pleasure. <laughs> okay, so what is your role here at the Slater Museum? Well, I serve both as director of the museum and also as its curator, which means that I have to daily make decisions about the presentation of objects and the care of objects and their interpretation to the public. It's very interesting. And how did this museum come into existence? Well, it actually was a gift made by William Slater, who was an alumnus of the Norwich Free Academy. And the gift was made to honor his father, John Fox Slater, who was an industrialist and um, also a philanthropist who gave money around Norwich to found things like theaters and uh, he helped to found the Norwich Free Academy. Mm -hmm. He also, uh, just before his death, he made a gift of one million dollars to create a fund to educate freed slaves, which was very far thinking at the time. And the equivalent day in today's dollars is about $23 million. So he died, unfortunately, young at about the age of 69. And after he died, his son, who, as I said, was an alumnus of the Norwich Free Academy, wanted to make a gift of this building to the academy and to serve the community. And so it is named the John Fox Slater Memorial Building. Well, that's really cool. And um, so what are the renovations that you recently completed? Well, we built a new atrium, which is between the Slater Building and the Norton Gymnasium. And it also connects to a newer gymnasium, which we call the Alumni Gym. And it connects to the Converse Art Building, which is to the rear of the Slater Building. And it functions not only to provide amenities like new lavatories and meeting spaces, it also has a new collection storage facility in its basement. And most important, it has an elevator and ramping system which makes every floor of the museum accessible. Oh, wow, that's really awesome. And um, so what are different exhibits in the area that we can see today? Well, part of the process to get reopened after our construction, which took about two years, was to de-install and protect all of the collections in the museum. And then we began to reinstall, and it gave us an opportunity to reinterpret all of our collections. So when you come to the museum now, you will still see the cast collection. Many people were nervous that we were going to take away the casts. Everybody loves the casts, which yeah. is great. But we have refreshed them. In many cases, they had cracks and chips that have been repaired. We um, refurbished all of their pedestals and lighting and made the whole space brighter, lighter, and better interpreted. 
We also created new exhibits that feature 350 years of Norwich history, including objects made in Norwich and that were significant to tell the story of Norwich history. And in addition, we have a new exhibit on Connecticut artists of the 20th century, so the century just passed. And we have a new exhibit on African art. In addition and finally, we have a terrific exhibit that actually opened a few years ago, but we had to almost immediately close it for the construction, an exhibit on William and Ellen Slater's grand tour. They took a trip for 17 months around the world on their private yacht. Oh, so. that sounds awesome. Yeah, I'd like to go. Yeah, me too. Would you mind showing us some of your favorite pieces? Not at all. My last name is Hall, Marianne Hall. My background is in art and art history, so I use the museum as a classroom. This is now the oldest building on this campus. The original Norwich Free Academy was torn down, and, and the school was incorporated in 1854 and then opened in 1856. This building was dedicated in 1886. Right. I can give you background on the, the, some of the casts and things. I'm, f I'm fascinated by lots of those things because I've photographed a lot of the originals at different sites, like I've been to Olympia and places, and it amazes me. The casts that we have upstairs have been in the building since 1888. And so that would mean that lots of them were made, had to be shipped across the Atlantic Ocean, and then brought in and then reassembled in this building, right? Without electricity, without all these other things. And they're exact copies. They allowed you to touch the originals to make the pieces. So I've done a lot of uh, extensively, I think, research on cast collections. And then it became really quite vogue for a while. And then people destroyed their cast collections in the 1920s and 30s because they wanted modern art. Right? They didn't need replicas and things like so. So I'm going to take you through the atrium, right? And what I think is really beautiful about the atrium is that they didn't destroy the integrity of the architecture of the building. When you see the brickwork on the outside, for instance, it's not, it's really beautiful. This is a logo right here that was designed by one of the uh, <clears throat> heads of the art school. Her name was Charlotte Fuller Eastman and they still use this on the, the podium and the letterheads and things like so. Wow. So they incorporated it in this thing like that. The Roman numerals right there, right? You see it? Open, the school opened in 1856. You had to take a test to get into the school. I found the first test if you ever want to take it. Was that right? Yes. Look at how beautiful. So when you see this magnificent view right here, when this school opened, you see where that apartment building is? Yeah. It's called the Blackstone Apartments. It was a one single family uh, dwelling. It was a mansion, right? It was called the Blackstone Mansion. And you had all these mansions around here. It looked like Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> so people donated money to start the school. And Mr. Blackstone was one of the original uh, donors. And the people who lived in that White House right there, their names were Williams. Instead of donating money, they gave the land for the school to be built on. So the school was built around this pristine area with tree-lined streets and surrounded by mansions. I don't know what happened to him. Well, Mr. Slater himself, right? He was, he had to be wealthy. He was, he 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 was a, yeah, he was considered the wealthiest man in Norwich. He was the president of the Panema Mill. They, they made their fortunes initially from textiles. He was a descendant of Samuel Slater who would, uh, brought over the knowledge of the Arkwright loom. Oh, it's kind of fascinating. Let's go, we have scholarly things to do. That's right, that's
This is the way you cast are made in contemporary times with this type of thing. Oh, nice display. You can see the seam marks. They were done in pieces. They allowed you, as I told you, to touch the original to make the cast. There are metal armatures underneath these. If these are broken, it's because the originals were rediscovered that way. And most of them relate to mythological concepts of, of gods and goddesses, stories. Like this is after the clash of the titans when they're fighting the giants. So these are giants right here. Greeks wanted gods to look human. It's a term that's called anthropomorphic art. What's very fascinating about it is that if you want to have something that's very stately, it's very good to use vertical lines. Very, you react psychologically from that kind of thing. You know who Laocoon is. When they found that piece, which was 1506, Pope Julius brought it into the Vatican collection. Prior to that time, that would have been thought to be pagan and they wouldn't have done that. But new arms were carved and attached to the original piece. And then in the 20th century, it was deemed by a lot of uh, people in the museum and uh, artistic communities that you should take away added parts. So if you went to see it, it doesn't look like this anymore. So all of these casts came in from different sites. Right? If you wanted to see this one, you'd have to go to Germany. But it, originally, it was in a place in Turkey called Pergamon. The Nike that's behind you, she was found on an island uh, without her heads and arms. So lots of these are broken because of earthquakes. Several of them are broken because of wars. And here's Apollo with his arms stretched out way over there. He goes way up on top of a building. If you, if you look here, see this piece right here it's called the pediment? And then you'd have a capital and a column here. So we'd walk underneath this. Then the, the, the top part of the building would go either on the east or west side. This is this. See how big it is? This is Apollo, and the centaurs are on that side. The rest is not <clears throat> visible here. If you went into the museum at Olympia, and they've got a beautiful new museum there, they have these pieces on display, and they go all the way across the room. They're absolutely fantastic. And <clears throat> this housed uh, the Temple of Zeus, right? And Apollo is here, as I pointed out, like so. So those ladies with a <clears throat> without their heads were once part of the Parthenon, they'd be on display like this and the horses' heads would be on that. So lots of them are parts of architectural things. And inside the temple of Zeus at Olympia, there was a statue that probably went almost to the ceiling. It was made of gold and ivory. It was of Zeus, right? They melted it down in the time of Constantine because it would be thought to be pagan, right?
Th these pieces are Cypriot. But you see that, and this is an early Greek piece. You see the similarity? These are called the Koros. And normally they're depicted nude. The cores uh, of the female forms are, have clothing, etc. They all have these smiles on their faces. No matter what they do, they're smiling. We have a pediment pieces from a temple um, of Ephea on, on an island called Egana. And the people, are, they're archaic. That's what you call that, that kind of style, archaic. And probably depicting the Trojan War. And the warriors laying down dying, right? They smile. Someone else has got a, a spear in his hand and he smiles, right? But they follow those things. They don't deviate. It's not art for art's sake. This is in the Acropolis Museum. The eyes would have semi-precious stones, right, like so. And I told you they painted the things. You can see the, the remnants of paint on that gravestone right there. It looks very Egyptianized. So they're reds and things. There's a new theory. I'll show you that, too. But this, this is from the 5th century, right? This is called the canon, C-A-N-O-N, the model for classical sculpture. Very serene. It has this contrapost opposed to it, which is an S-shaped curve to the body. They deduce, for instance, the, the form, almost mathematically, seven and a half heads to the thing. And it's very uh, elongated in, the, in that vertical sense, very serene in its confidence, etc. It, too, would be painted, so the eyes would be painted like so. And so you can see the contrast between, the, here's my friends over here from the uh, temple that are smiling as they're dying, et cetera. <laughs> and this is the model of the Acropolis with the Parthenon, right? So <clears throat> the Romans conquered the Greeks. You wonder who conquered whom. This is the Roman temple at the time. And under Hadrian, of course, they use Athens as an art center, et cetera. And the theater is here. They have a new museum now in uh, Athens. It's, I, I photographed it from standing on this hill. And they have... They have, on the third floor, a very large opening so you can see through the ceiling. And they, that's the place they want the Parthenon pieces back. Oh, that are from, okay. They're in England right now, right? Mm -hmm. the, lots of these pieces that were part of the Parthenon were taken away. Um, the building blew up in 1687. Uh, in the early 1800s, they were taken away, right? At one time, you could do that. If you found things, you, now they have laws against these things like so. so. And didn't they use the Parthenon for a while to store ammunition? Yeah, that's so how, that it, was how it was blown, blown up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The Turks <laughs> occupied Athens and they used it to store gunpowder. The enemies were the Venetians and the Venetians had cannons and the cannonballs hit the gunpowder and the place blew, right? So the ladies toppled their heads. But they lay there in absentia for a long period of time and then Elgin took them away. Right. It's amazing. Wow. September 26, 1687, 6.30 p.m. The, the, the captain's name was Morrisoni. There's the bell. Kind of we have a exhibition that's currently on display, and I put um, catalogs down there if you want one. It's a juried show. It's called the Connecticut Artist Show, and <clears throat> people paid money to enter. The only requirement is that you live in Connecticut. So of the... 430 to 50 pieces that were uh, submitted, there's 143 on display. So the catalog, and you put your own prices down. So if you want to buy before you leave, you let me know. <laughs> we'll put a little red dot on things. So it's kind of interesting. That stays up to the end that we put children's work up. We have a program for children on Saturdays. And uh, then we put the high school show up. Great. It'll be the 122nd year of the high school show. Right. Yeah. The high school was fun. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Good to see you again. Yes, I'll be around. If okay. you need help with anything, let me know.